Thank you for coming. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, and really want to uh, thank the organizer, Linux Foundation, organizing the whole event. Um, last night, uh, you gonna actually get a chance to go to Guinness uh, Storehouse? No? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a great event, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I love the food and um, I love the, um, all, all the entertainment and also you know, the, the, uh, the drum performance, it was great. And the interesting, the most interesting part to me is actually the um, meeting with all the people last night. I met with so many different companies, different people. And interestingly, when I sit down for dinner um, and the lady was sitting next to me and I kind of talked to him, I talked to her, uh, she actually um, came from Canada working for a university and she is a professor. And she's working on a healthcare project, kind of similar to what I'm doing. And she's kind of uh, solving a different aspect of the problem, which is uh, security, protecting data from a smartwatch, and then how, to, how it actually gets sent to a server. So after the uh, dinner discussion, it was very interesting. We promised to uh, keep in contact and see if there's a chance that uh, we can work together uh, after uh, the conference. So, so um, today, uh, I wanted to make this a little bit more interesting for the audience. So I prepared some gift. Uh, for a small gift, and I'll ask um, three questions at the end. If you can correctly answer them, you can, uh, you can get one of the gifts. So pay attention. <laughs> so today, um, my talk is about Recover Monitor. So basically, edge-based um, open source wearable devices, how you actually capture all the uh, biomarkers from the uh, patient, and then basically send it over to the doctors, and running certain AI uh, engines, um, able to analyze whether the patient is actually on a very good recovery path, um, and then with precision and efficiency. So that's basically the talk of uh, today. The entire project is open source. So before we get into the uh, technical details, I have another, my, uh, an, another of my colleagues, uh, Pangdu. He uh, unfortunately is not able to come on site, but he prepared a video, so I'll play that video, and he'll talk about the architecture for the solutions and also give a demo. So, but before that, uh, let me give you a quick overview of what I'm talking about. So the remote patient monitoring market trend. Uh, this is a huge market, and uh, the American Heart Association basically defined this, which is a set of um, uh, telehealth um, and facilitate patient monitoring, uh, as well as transfer of patient-generated health data. And then basically helping the, the healthcare team um, to basically manage uh, these patients in a timely manner. So in terms of user, uh, very interesting uh, stats, basically uh, double between 2020 to 2025 to about 70.6 million, which is huge. And then looking at the market uh, in terms of revenue generated, it's projected to generate 175 um, uh, billion uh, in 2027. So if you look at the diagram kind of bar chart on the bottom of that green bar, uh, roughly about uh, one fourth is about devices revenue, and then about three fourth is actually software and services, which kind of, kind of makes sense. Uh, lots of investment actually need to be made to build the software infrastructure, which is what kind of what we're trying to do here as well. And then according to uh, Spyglass Consulting uh, Group, nine out of 10 healthcare providers are already testing and considering testing uh, remote patient monitoring. It's actually 88%. Uh, and why they are so interested? Uh, because these, these are all the three major benefits actually highlighted by uh, Cat Minds. Uh, number one, improve patient outcomes, uh, which of course is the concern of all the doctors out there, how to improve the patient outcome of their patients. And the second is improve uh, compliance uh, rates, uh, basically making sure their methods, their delivery, the infrastructure, the data, everything is compliant to the industry uh, standards. And then the third one is also quite important, is the patient actually want to know more about the health. So all these uh, services, basically giving them information, the history, the data, and they give them a view of how their health is progressing over time, and they will be able to take additional actions. So, so let's, let's drill into the uh, smartwatch um, market particularly, um, because we'll be using a uh, smartwatch uh, in this research, and I'm actually wearing myself right here, and I'll show you a little bit later. So um, according to uh, CounterPoint, um, they're forecasting um, uh, very healthy growth, in fact, last quarter, Q2 2022, uh, actually grew about 13% uh, year over year. Um, and one market actually is a highlight here, which is uh, India, growing about 300%, over 300%. Uh, 
uh, which is significant. And Apple is leading, as you can see, 29 from 3%. Uh, Samsung is second, uh, maintaining a very healthy growth, uh, 40% year over year growth. And Huawei, actually uh, number one spot in China for several quarters already. Uh, already. And then again, India, uh, which is a very, very high growth, 347%. Uh, what is interesting is, if you look at this data, uh, the India market, um, um, actually uh, in Q2 2022, about 30% of the smartwatch they're selling is actually below $50. So a very low price point, and that's why they're able to basically uh, jump in uh, uh, numbers in sales. And, and these are the two vendors, actually the top ones in India right now, um, the Firebolt and also Noise. Um, if you look at uh, actually one quarter before in Q1, they were not even there. <laughs> so within a very short time, they're able to jump up to uh, number four and number five uh, in the overall uh, market. And, and why, why are we using a smartwatch? I think one of the main reasons is very affordable. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, India market, um, the cheapest version that they are uh, selling very well is actually below $50. Uh, a lot of these stats are pretty much uh, supported by um, most of the smartwatch that you can find in the market today. Uh, we're talking about body temperature, uh, blood, blood, uh, blood oxygen, uh, heart rate, uh, stress level, or, or sleep pattern. So these are quite common. But what is interesting is if you look at some of the leading um, brands, uh, leading product out there in the market, um, there are innovation actually being made by a lot of these companies. And I, will, I will actually want to highlight um, one product and one research uh, that might be very interesting for you. Um, one is actually uh, blood pressure. So this company actually created a product that able to measure blood pressure of the patient, of the person actually wearing it. So this is one of the watch actually can do a blood pressure. So if you look at this watch, it's actually a little bit big, but if you look at the, uh, the wristband, this is actually an uh, uh, air pump. So the watch can pump air and put pressure on my wrist, and be able to measure uh, blood pressure. And I actually uh, tested it myself, and then I used a real uh, blood pressure uh, device, and then compared to the watch, actually pretty accurate. So, so this is one of the uh, very interesting way how people, patients, can actually use uh, normal regular consumer devices and able to get more insight into their health. And then looking at a very interesting research, if you look at the bottom uh, um, uh, uh, animation pictures, um, this is actually uh, done by researchers uh, in UC San Diego in California. So what they did is actually they came up with a device, a very tiny device you can see on, uh, this person wearing it on the arm, uh, with a lot of um, hundreds of these uh, micro needles. These micro needles, very, very thin, about one fifth of a human hair, they're able to basically um, detect the uh, biomolecules right underneath the skin. Uh, so interstitial uh, uh, fluid under the skin, and able to basically detect uh, three things, glucose level, alcohol level, and lactate level. And these are all interrelated, so that's very important for doctors or, or, or the patient to actually keep track of these, uh, how they uh, changes over time. If you look at the, this particular device, what, what is interesting in this device is it's not um, penetrable. I mean, there's not something that built into your skin, uh, underneath your skin, which is uh, nowadays, if you go out to the commercial market, buy a product like this, you have to buy something like that, which is commercially available today. Um, of course, there's uh, some um, in comfort. People don't like putting something under the skin. Uh, and this one is actually uh, no pain and also not penetrable. It doesn't have to be uh, put under the screen. It's just patched on the arm, able to send all the signal wirelessly to a smartphone, and they're able to capture that and do further analysis. And there are other companies doing this also. Uh, this company, uh, Sugabit, uh, Nofio Sense or Glucowise, um, Graphware, these are all startup companies trying to commercialize something like this in the market. And, and personally, I'm very excited about this because this is actually what uh, uh, a lot of people want, um, able to measure all this glucose level and making sure they are monitoring that on a regular basis and able to uh, adjust their daily behavior accordingly if they're seeing some, uh, some changes in the level that they don't uh, like to see. So next, I, I want to show you a video basically showing you how this watch can measure uh, blood pressure.
It's important how you wear this watch. Like I said, you use the wrist measurement, you get this adjusted. It's pretty easy to adjust. You just lift this up, you can move it up and down, and this moves. And uh, basically, the airbag is on one side. And once you do that, now, the thing is, when you put it in, you literally need to kind of put your two fingers here so to, you get the exact spot on where to wear your watch to ensure. And then you make sure to push the airbag down correctly and you get a relatively snug fit. Because if you don't get a snug fit, it's not going to do your blood pressure reading. In fact, when you do the ECG reading, you might have to move it up a little more because it asks for the watch to be on the wrist bone a little more. So how do you do your blood pressure reading? Press the top button, top right hand button. You can either go slide horizontal or vertical. Now you press this measure and then it will tell you that you need to kind of lift your hand up so that it is diagonally across your upper body but it's not pressed down and you kind of support your wrist. It has given me a reading systolic, diastolic including the pulse. So as I said I have exact watch uh, here right, right now. So after this talk, if you are interested to try it out, stay behind and then uh, we, can, we can do some uh, live demo, which is the great part about uh, being uh, physically here uh, on site for the uh, conference. So another interesting innovation about uh, using smartwatch to monitor health of the patient or persons. Um, this is one example that was actually uh, launched uh, end of last year in China. Uh, what they actually did is they recording the coughing sound, um, about 15 seconds, and then basically uh, pass that sound over to uh, the smartphone. And then the smartphone basically using certain AI model, combining the data with the body temperatures, with the uh, breathing rate, uh, heart rate, and blood, 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 uh, oxygen uh, level. And then use also data and pass it to the AI uh, engine, and then doing inference, and then basically find out uh, if the person actually have a certain potential uh, lung infection risk. So this is uh, very interesting. Um, and I foresee, of, of course, today in the uh, COVID situation, this might be a very helpful uh, way to monitor um, COVID patients at home. Um, and the last, last point I actually want to raise up uh, is actually uh, the World Lung Day is coming up, uh, September 25th. Um, so try to spread awareness about this. Um, and then the next um, topic, I actually want to go into a, a deeper into uh, looking at where the market is heading. Um, with uh, last year, Facebook changed their name to uh, Meta. There are a lot of attention in the virtual world, uh, Metaverse. And people started thinking, um, okay, with the virtual world, is there anything that can benefit the uh, healthcare industries? Is there anything that, can, that, that the healthcare industry can make use of and then benefit the uh, future uh, development? So, there are three areas, I believe, is actually very interesting. Uh, one is actually medical device development. Um, they can actually try to use that uh, di digital twin idea to improve the design, development, testing of these uh, de uh, devices. Um, and then the digital twin of the human person, they can actually use the gener generic makeup of the person, the behavior, the lifestyle of that person, and then duplicate it as a digital twin, and then basically apply a personalized treatment plan uh, and that will basically help uh, fine-tune a personalized uh, uh, recovery plan for those particular patients. And then for the healthcare facility, uh, is uh, testing if the facility have a bottleneck in the future, if they scale up to many patients coming in, which is uh, highly likely the case uh, in the early stage of uh, COVID. We've we all seen uh, un a sudden surge of all these uh, patients coming in. Uh, can the uh, hospital actually able to cater for that uh, search? Uh, what other areas can improve in terms of optimizing the operation strategies and, and, and so on? So, so with that, let me show you a quick uh, video uh, actually done by uh, uh, Analytics uh, Insight, uh, which actually give a little bit more detail uh, about the uh, usage. Digital twins are a digital representation of a physical object, process, or service. Its key value proposition to digital twins is in their ability to combine real-time data, physical dependency models, and intelligence from different platforms to simulate,
predict and improve assets and processes. The healthcare industry is turning towards digital twins to improve customized medicine, healthcare organization performance, and new medicines and devices. Top ways in which digital twins can transform the healthcare industry. Digital twin can predict multiple outcomes for specific procedure of any treatment by simulating an invasive clinical procedure. Digital twin can provide assistance in evaluating the right therapy and diagnosis for each patient to cure chronic diseases by reducing medical risks. Digital twin are used in hospitals to simulate workflow processes to detect potential errors in the existing system. Smart wearables of patients can feed the digital twin in the cloud with real-time health data to detect certain symptoms at early stages. Digital Twin can enhance the performance of healthcare devices by running hundreds of simulations with different conditions in different patients. Digital Twin can create a digital copy of real patients to help in drug development and dosage optimization efficiently. Doctors can receive sufficient data from patients' body and observe different vitals, medical conditions, response to medicines, diet, blood sugar data, and many more in the Digital Twin copy. Digital Twin can assist residents in medical training and diagnostics of patients' copy for virtual surgery and a better understanding of human body anatomy, physiological and anatomical difference from person to person. Though simulations have been there earlier too, they have been vital in today's healthcare industry. Digital Twins are capable of creating useful models based on information collected from wearable devices and patient records to gather data. Digital twins are spreading in diverse streams based on other technological advancements. And this opens the doors for treating and diagnosing patients with the help of the latest technologies. For more such updates, subscribe to Analytics Insight. So this company actually uh, gave out this three scenario in a little bit more detail. Um, and I welcome you to uh, actually including a link uh, to that video. There's a, lot, uh, a little bit more detail that you can actually uh, look at. Um, I will share the uh, PDF. Uh, anyone interested, uh, send me an email. I can share the entire deck to, uh, to you. So you actually have all these links. And then kind of summarizing a little bit um, of my own uh, observations about remote patient monitoring. Uh, of course, it's safer because the patient is going to be staying home and the doctor basically remote diagnostic uh, monitoring the health of this patient. So uh, it's actually getting uh, uh, more and more popular, especially during uh, COVID. And the second point is, uh, I believe the continuous patient monitoring actually is gonna be very important. And then with the uh, smartwatch devices, uh, affordable, actually affordable pricing right now, uh, long battery life. Um, there's extended uh, long battery life uh, functions in a lot of the top brand uh, watches. It can actually last like two weeks uh, without uh, charging. Um, and then the interface actually have been improving. Uh, you obviously have seen uh, a lot of uh, top companies like, like Apple uh, just recently announced some new addition to their uh, watch products. Uh, so this is actually innovations that actually help push the uh, entire market forward. And then early health risk uh, detections, um, especially the patients is going to be wearing the uh, watch 24 by 7, even sleeping, so they can monitor the sleep pattern. So that will help actually have the full picture of the entire day from morning to night, even sleeping time, to detect basically if there's potentially a health risk. And then all these AI uh, advancements. Uh, and today, this morning, you probably heard the uh, keynote. Uh, PyTorch, one of the leading uh, framework uh, for AI um, development actually, was now moved into uh, Linux Foundation. So it's a PyTorch Foundation now. Um, so all these advancements in AI modeling, which what we also base on uh, our research on, is to analyze all this data from all the patients and then able to come up with a meaningful uh, analysis and then help the doctor to actually pinpoint the uh, issues. And the last point is open source. Uh, which, uh, obviously, the, why we're all here in this forum, open source uh, forum, is the open source community. There's a lot of uh, related research, individual contributor contributing to the open source community on this he particular healthcare uh, kind of industry. So that pushes all the tech companies, all the uh, research areas into advancing uh, this area. So we, uh, in this project, we're actually working with two researchers uh, from University of Washington. Um, so Dr. Uh, Erica uh, Parson and also uh, Dr. Pierre Moret. 
Um, and we are, we are supporting them in their research. Basically, they're using the MI, uh, ML model, the machine learning model, to have uh, a detection for the uh, ischemic uh, stroke patients. Um, and right after this, uh, I'll pass it to uh, my colleagues, and he'll talk a little bit uh, more about how they're actually using some of the gizmo devices uh, and AI model to analyze the, um, the, the patients. And last, um, talking about very high level, what uh, we are trying to do here. So we have obviously the smartwatch on the left side, uh, basically gathering all the sensor data. We take uh, user privacy very highly, uh, making sure all the user data being being protected. Uh, there are several mechanisms that we actually adopted. Uh, of course, the, uh, the the HIPAA compliance, and also we are talking about uh, some of the latest advancement from tech company like Google. So Google several months ago they announced um, this Health Connect uh, uh, technology and allowing um, developers developing apps to access all this health data from the end user. So there will be a user consent. User have to consent, uh, basically allowing developer to access certain of their health data. And also the permission is not like all data have to be specified what, what kind of data developers are using. And also they cannot um, basically use the data for advertising purpose, for example. So there's certain guidelines, certain um, uh, restrictions being uh, put together, allowing a central location storing all this health data being protected um, and not being misused. By all this uh, data, so in our, in our, in our, in our research, uh, basically all this data, we're sending it to the smartphone. And smartphone will basically have a feedback loop to allow the doctor to basically feedback to the, to the patient. At the same time, the data will be basically sent over to the cloud to allow the doctors um, from the hospital are able to see and analyze this data using AI model. So we are using uh, open source uh, framework that, that we developed several years ago, it's called Cooper Edge. And there's an edge core and cloud core the edge core is actually hosted entirely in the, uh, within the hospital uh, private network. So it's totally uh, protected. There's no outside connection to it. It's only allowed the uh, doctors to, to analyze the data. And then they're potentially, by removing a lot of this user-specific information, the data, the, all this data can actually be sent in a central location, allowing the AI model to be trained to be uh, much more efficient and much, more, uh, much better outcome. Uh, without particular user data. So still, again, the pr user privacy is very important. And then with that, uh, I'll play the video of my colleagues who are basically going through uh, some of these uh, uh, data architecture and also demo uh, within this second. This is about uh, 20 minutes. Okay, with the uh, introduction Preston gave about uh, the smartwatch, I'm here to uh, talk more about how we can uh, utilize the smartwatch in a, in a medical uh, recovery scenario. In this picture, uh, as we can see, uh, apparently the it's only the right half of the plate is the food on the right side of the plate is it has been eaten. This uh, is a special kind of uh, situation where a patient, if the patient has suffered from a effect called the uh, left neglect, uh, this happens when the right side of the brain is damaged during a stroke. So if a patient has suffered a stroke and the right side of the brain is damaged, then uh, it affects how much the patient can see on the on the left side. Even though there's no problem to the to the eyes, um, the uh, the information collected from the the on the left side is not able to process well uh, in the right brain. Okay. And uh, the, the project originated from University of Washington, Basel, and uh, it's called the Stroke Rehabilitation and Project. So uh, in their original setting, there's, uh, so the patient will be uh, uh, fit into an environment with EEG machine to collect the, the brain wave. And uh, there's a small gizmo machine that's gonna be following a curve the patient will follow the, the, the will try to follow this gizmo machine and when the machine goes to the left and right uh, if the machine goes out of the, the face what the, the, the patient can see then there's some information special about that uh, uh, left neglected uh, uh, condition from the EEG and the, from the eye tracking um, so altogether the eye tracking machine here and the gizmo and the EEG are there to collect data based on uh, from the brainwave, from the eye movement, 
Um, and the, the ultimate goal is to be able to help with uh, this uh, 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 post-stroke rehabilitation by using machine learning-based detection and analysis. This is uh, originally the, uh, the, from the UW uh, 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 department. So uh, they have two departments working on this. It's a, a collaboration between the, 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 the medical uh, hospital and uh, the university from the electrical engineering and the computer science. Okay, uh, then uh, the way we come in to help with is that uh, originally the professors from the university wants to, in, uh, to improve the, 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 the capability by providing some local computing and uh, collect data and the data can be processed here. And uh, originally the, thing, the thinking is, so far everything we are seeing is only within the perimeter of one hospital. And uh, the, apparently there's uh, the resource, the computing resources, the storage size, the power consumption, those are things are very limited. And also uh, this is only, uh, they can collect data who is in this hospital. So there's a, a lot of a limitation to this setup. So um, the idea is to, uh, to provide some additional thing, uh, uh, to provide some additional uh, ways to uh, help, to improve the, 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 the capability. One, the first way to do this is by using a smart watch. So the EEG machine and eye tracking are only two source of data to, uh, uh, to work on this. But uh, currently, as the president has mentioned, the uh, smart watch uh, currently can provide a, a lot more information like heart rate, blood temperature, blood oxygen, and so on and so forth. They can uh, not only be used in the hospital, but also they can use in a home environment. So it's very easy access for patients to use. Um, one example I can give is uh, the, one of the professors is trying uh, to use this uh, heart rate uh, together with the EEG to, uh, to use the correlation to get rid of some noise collected during the EEG uh, uh, scanning. So that's the first benefit by using a smartwatch that more uh, data will be provided, more information will, will be obtained and together with the EEG machine and eye tracking, they can provide a lot of insight. The second site that we want to improve this scenario is to provide the uh, cloud computing and edge computing. Altogether, the cloud computing and edge computing are to, uh, to achieve this federated learning. It's a special kind of machine learning where you take models from different small models and you aggregate them, you get the insight among all those models and produce a, a more powerful uh, machine learning model. Um, uh, in addition to this, the cloud apparently has more computing resources, it has more storage and it has more power. That's way beyond what the hospital can provide. And uh, in the edge computing scenario, uh, they can provide a more variant essentially because uh, as we said, the, uh, for one hospital, they can only have a certain amount of patients. But uh, if we combine the information collected from different hospitals, then uh, a more powerful, a more insightful uh, machine learning model can be produced. So these are the three benefits, the three key benefits. So the smartwatch provide more data, the edge computing and the cloud computing all together will provide the uh, more more uh, computing power and analytical capability into the data collected. And speaking of these two benefits, um, the, there's also a question about the, uh, the uh, data privacy. Apparently, uh, if we go back here, all the, if we collect data from a hospital, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a straightforward that uh, we can uh, send the data to the cloud for, for computation. The, all the data in, um, in the hospital has to be pre-processed, to be filtered, to be, uh, all those privacy information has to be uh, 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 removed be before we are able to send the data. We, we have confidence to send the data to the cloud. So uh, in, in our project, these are a few uh, synergy ways that we, we are trying to provide. One is uh, by using the edge computing, we can uh, uh, offer an opportunity to, to pre-process the data before it goes out of the hospital. And the second one, of course, is the, the capability of uh, the cloud and the capability of the edge infrastructure themselves. And the third one is uh, we want to be able to provide a simple way 
for the hospital or for the patient to use. The, all these things, for example, for the cloud and for the edge, we're using the open source Kubernetes and the Kube Edge. Those are things uh, that are great, but they are not straightforward to set up together. We're together with, for example, the cloud and all, all these things for people who are not in uh, uh, with who, who do not have a computer background <clears throat> or even the, the cloud edge computing background. It's not easy for them to set up. And one of the goal for us is to have the doctor, for example, in the hospital to be able to plug this in to the power, plug this in into the internet, and then they can start collecting data. Um, so here I'm gonna give a demo. Uh, the demo the, for simplicity due to the time constraint, uh, we're gonna show a simple end-to-end -end data flow. <clears throat> the, the point is to show that uh, we are able to collect data from a smartwatch and uh, the data will be collected uh, by a uh, computer resources on the edge. The edge is, is for, for example, hospital. And eventually the data will be sent to the cloud uh, and uh, the, for further analysis. So the data started from the watch, it's a heart rate, and then uh, it goes uh, to the hospital, uh, it goes into the computing resources on the edge in the hospital, and then the data will be eventually sent to the cloud. Uh, if we just uh, send this part, as, if we write this part separately, it's, uh, it's, it's not as hard, but uh, we here we want to utilize the uh, powerful tools uh, for the edge computing, for example, Kubernetes, to manage all this, right? For, for all the hospitals, uh, remember one of the goal is to make things easier, and we do not want the hospital to have their own program running on their uh, local computer, then uh, uh, then uh, all the hospital, they'll have different versions. Then uh, once we come to deployment, upgrade, those things get more and more complicated and people eventually abandon them. We want to provide a, 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 a simplified and a, a unified framework so that the hospital, they can run the same program if we have update. It's a very easy to, to update all this program, either running in the cloud or running in the hospital. And by saying that, uh, apparently there will be application running on the edge, there will be application running in the cloud. And to be able to uh, to control this app, to do the deployment, to do the upgrade, probably you, you already sense there's uh, Kubernetes coming. And uh, the, uh, in this demo, we're gonna put them in a Docker container. And uh, for the cloud side, we're using the, the Kubernetes. And for the edge side, we're using the open source Kube Edge to uh, to essentially add this node as one of the node in the cluster in the cloud. We also have, uh, apparently, this application is running uh, on a worker node in a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, but this is also running as uh, an edge node as part of this cluster, as the same cluster. So the control plan is in the cloud. We have one uh, cloud worker node and we have one edge worker node, okay? Um, so let's see the demo. So for the to to simulate this edge uh, node, so the calling it edge means it's not part of the cloud. It has to be outside what we use here. So what we use here is AWS uh, environment. So uh, to have something outside the AWS environment, we put this node in. Um, we are using Google Cloud. Uh, a virtual machine from Google Cloud. Uh, the goal here again is to separate to to say we have two nodes in two separate network. One is the cloud, one is some other network. This uh, doesn't have to be in the cloud. This can be a, a Raspberry Pi machine running in the hospital or some kind of machine running in the hospital. So this is uh, the, the reason we use Google Cloud is just so that it's outside the AWS network. So here uh, we can see on the left, we have the Kubernetes running on this two virtual machine. Um, this is the, the the master machine this is the worker node and on the right is the google cloud edge machine um, so uh, if we go to this uh, uh, let's see if we uh, go to this kubernetes uh, control plan we can see that uh, the, the the three nodes that are running here this is a control plan this is the cloud uh, the cloud master node this is the uh, let's see uh, this is the cloud worker node, and this is this one is the the edge worker node. Okay, currently we have two apps running. 
One is the cloud and the, the, the cloud app, and the other is the edge app. The two app here, if we go back to this picture, is the cloud app here running in the cloud and the edge app here running on the edge. All right, so uh, that's the setup, that's the environment. But uh, okay, for the watch, we're uh, for simplicity, we're just using the this emulator, and uh, for this uh, smartwatch emulator, uh, we are using the heart rate. The goal here is to whenever we change the heart rate on this smartwatch, then uh, it's going to send the data uh, to the to the edge machine. Uh, if we remember here again, uh, so the watch will send data to the edge machine. And um, this can be done either through uh, Bluetooth or HTTP request. Here we're using HTTP request. It's also going to send the patient information. That's uh, for us to say uh, the watch usually carries some information that should not be sent to the cloud. And we'll see that that, that information will be stripped by the edge machine before it sends to the cloud, okay? Um, so here, is the edge machine so this is the google cloud as you can see from the google so this is the the edge machine on this edge machine we're running some code to take data uh, from the from the phone uh, from the smartwatch uh, just a code that we don't have to go into the details here but the one thing i want to, to point out is um, when we receive data and when we are about to send it to the cloud um, uh, so we'll actually, when we receive data, we are going to receive the patient information from the watch. And uh, even though the patient information will be stored in the database, but uh, when we are preparing the data to be sent to the cloud, as you can see, we are only sending the heart rate and uh, so a time. Uh, we are not sending the patient. This is to just to demo that the sensitive information from the smartwatch can be uh, uh, filtered out, can be taken out of, of the data before it goes out of the hospital. And okay, so that's that. Uh, the data we are going to receive is in this file. So let's just uh, follow this file. Here, we already have some, some data there, so that's fine. Let's do a follow here, okay. Back to the watch. Uh, here, again, we want to change the uh, heart rate. Uh, but uh, before that, let's go inside the app and uh, start this app. So here is you can see that uh, this is the, the IP address of this Edge machine. Actually, the pod running, uh, the application running on the Edge machine. And uh, if we start, uh, it was going to uh, try whenever there's new data coming in. This is the code that, I, that, 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 that does that. So whenever the heart rate change, it will send the, the heart rate to this application running on the edge. So this is the heart rate uh, on this emulator. We can use this to uh, let's change. Uh, let's just make a few changes to 500, which is super high for human, uh, and then back to 10, and then back to 297. Okay, now let's get back to uh, here. Uh, as we can see, we have 500 and 297. So that means the data has been uh, received on the edge machine. If we use this, uh, the, uh, the data has come from uh, one, uh, step one to step two, right? And step two, of course, will all continue. We'll, we'll uh, get rid of the, the sensitive information for the transmission to the cloud, and it will post that request to the cloud. So let's back go back to the cloud machine. Uh, let's see here, we are going to the control plan. This is the application running in the cloud in a container uh, in the cloud. So here. Let's see, we also have this uh, file, and as you can see, it's getting data 500, 5311, and 297. Those data are just uh, coming in from the cloud. Uh, if we go back to the picture here, the, the steps are uh, we get data from the smartwatch, and the, the smartwatch data will be either transmitted through a Bluetooth to the edge a node or through HTTP request. These are still actually within the hospital. The watch can be in the hospital. The watch actually should be in the hospital. 
once we have the data, the second step is uh, we uh, collect this, uh, uh, we do some cleansing, get rid of the sensitive information, and then send the data to the cloud. Once the cloud, uh, the data is in the AWS S3, uh, the cloud app will uh, pick that up. Uh, so the data we just saw that uh, that that's picked up from the cloud machine that actually they did not come from the edge directly. That come from the cloud storage because cloud storage has more space. So uh, and also it decouples the relationship between the the edge and the cloud. So the edge can just simply send that to the cloud and uh, it doesn't have to care whether the cloud actually receive it at that moment. Once the data is in the cloud, uh, the cloud machine, the cloud application will pick it up for some future processing. So that ends the demo. Um, uh, uh, apparently the demo is uh, the simplified version. Uh, it, it, the, the, uh, again, the goal here is to show the end-to-end the -end, uh, data flow. Once we have the data pass going from the watch to the edge to the cloud, then there are a few things we could do. One is uh, actually this is part of the, the, the research together with the Utah Basel professors. Uh, we can now provide a different uh, with a smartwatch, uh, we uh, are able to provide a more source of data, and uh, we want to use the federated learning, which means uh, on, in each hospital, we will train a, a local model and with the local data. So we have a different hospital, these are different hospitals, so each hospital will have their own uh, local model with their local data, and all this local model will be aggregated in the cloud uh, once the data is transmitted to the cloud. So that's the process we were trying to demo there. So the data is in the cloud. We have uh, uh, data from different hospital. The training process in the cloud, we will aggregate them. We will just put them together and uh, uh, send out the useful for the information uh, from the separate hospital back to their hospital. So now the, the updated model can uh, provide more capability to this local model for analysis. And of course, uh, I want to mention that uh, all this uh, additional information, it, it can be provided by some medical device, but with the, 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 the line of smartwatch that uh, we are providing, uh, it uh, makes things easier. And actually, the professor is uh, working with us to, uh, to try to use the data provided from this smartwatch. Um, for the open source, uh, of course, the, uh, this whole thing uh, with the cloud and edge, we want to make things straightforward, we want to make things easier to use. So open source is a, a very natural choice for us. So Kubernetes and the Kube Edge are used together uh, to facilitate this. The second part of uh, a future step is uh, Kube Edge, uh, given that it allow a node to be connected into the cluster uh, in the cloud, <clears throat> there's some limitation that uh, um, is still single node running in the hospital. If the hospital uh, has uh, more computing power, for example, if the hospital has their own Kubernetes cluster, then uh, how do we use this? Uh, for this kind of model here, uh, we have we at the future way have, have uh, another project, the edge computing project. So we call this Fornix, so the information is here. So uh, in this project, we're extending the Kube uh, edge into supporting multiple clusters instead of multiple nodes on the edge. Uh, that means we have control plan, and uh, that provides a lot of benefit with uh, the, uh, coming from this. So uh, also, for, for example, the hierarchical of the cluster can, can be uh, connected in different ways. Instead of just two layers, we can have different layers. And uh, this makes the federated, uh, federated learning uh, more attractive because now we have more regional model, and the regional model can be uh, sent to the cloud for a higher level uh, aggregation. Uh, we also have edge edge communication, and uh, the currently there's a serverless project that being developed so that uh, we can provide more capability there. Uh, in our mind, the uh, the future would look like this: we have a hospital, and the hospital have uh, the all kind of machines, including the smartwatch, to provide data for analysis. And also, it could be in the patient house. With the patient house, uh, we cannot bring all the, the medical devices in, but with smartwatch, it can also provide uh, some useful information and data. So all, all this data generated will be uh, processed locally and then uh, processed in the cloud uh, to provide a more uh, uh, a better, a uh, much better uh, 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 machine learning model 
to uh, for uh, for analysis. Okay, so that's all my uh, talk. I'll hand this back to uh, President. Thank you. So with this detailed discussion of the architecture, all the technology and open source that we are using, I hope you have a good understanding about uh, this research. And also, I think uh, this is the very first step. Uh, we will continue to invest and develop this. Uh, this is open source. So welcome anyone interested to uh, join this project and, and contribute uh, your effort. Uh, we will look at, uh, next step is look at um, leveraging the uh, smart host devices into different sensing data. And also at the same time, Figuring, figuring out if there's a actually better framework to protect the privacy of data. For example, as I mentioned earlier, using Google, uh, the Health Connect, is that a better way to do it? Or HIPAA compliance? So all of these are the things that we will look into in the future. And then, of course, from the uh, hospital perspective, the AI analysis part that will be working with University of Washington, uh, some of the professor work already kind of uh, started. So we will be um, focusing on those areas. So with that, as I mentioned, um, three questions. Uh, first, I uh, apologize to the uh, uh, online audience who is not uh, present here. Uh, this is only for, for the people here in, in this room. So first question, um, which country? India. Fastest. Uh, India. Yeah, good. Correct answer. And how fast are they growing? 300%. <laughs> yeah, more than 300%. So uh, three colors. Which one? Uh, black, blue, and... Pink. Black. black. Thank you. There you go. All right. Uh, second question. Name two types of sensor data that you can possibly capture using a smartwatch. Anyone? Heart rate, temperature. Heart rate and temperature. Temperature. Black uh, this is blue. Is it pink? No, the blue. Blue. Thank you. There you go. OK, last question. Uh, unfortunately, only one color left. Um, this is the one I mentioned earlier. What day is the World Lung Day this year? Do you remember? <laughs> what? September 25th. Correct. Good memory. <laughs> unfortunately, only pink. <laughs> So thank you. That concludes um, the talk today. Um, again, if you have interest contributing to this open source project, please contact us. And if you want to try out this uh, air pump with the uh, blood pressure monitoring of this smartwatch, stay here and uh, you can try it out also. Uh, yeah, question. Go ahead. Yes, as you mentioned, um, to email you the slides or will you post them? Or? Yeah, uh, send me an email. Um, what is the... Yep, right here. So my name, Preston.lao at fisherwire.com. Send me an email. I'll respond back to you with a PDF file. Uh, because we are running out of time, um, but if you have questions, feel free to stay behind, and I can answer all your questions.